warmly welcome you back to this sort of show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And uh, us is your host, Cristodo Brown, and me, Martin Despang. So we're going back to uh, wrapping up. It's going to be Powell of, 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 of having found out why we are so influenced by Chicago architecture. But we do this under the umbrella of uh, sadness uh, because um, this program is going to transition is a, is a nice way, as Jay called it, the think tank transition. But it, what it means, it leads to discontinuing the, the weekly rhythm. And if so, there will be ad hoc ones. So we have three more to go until the end of the month. So we thought, amongst many other things that we have pre-produced, we can't do. We have to, we owe it to you to wrap this year up. So doing that, we see here, we go back to Chicago. Our patron and advocate, uh, Dan Kubrick, my best buddy from college back then in Nebraska, who ever since moved to Chicago and worked for Helmut Jan, who passed away a few years ago, being run over by two cars on his bicycle. Dan, not trying to repeat that walk to work, and you see him here, he provided that picture uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, going to work uh, from where he was previously, which is the historic building in the very back there, which was the jeweler's building, or still is, over the bridge to the Wrigley building. And you see how freaking cold that is, was at that time. And it even made it into our start at the Tizer to just remind us how comfortable we have it here. So next slide. Uh, uh, is about one last time about Helmut John here in memory, in best memories, and also best memories top left is me on my promotion tour trying to get Joey and Lenny and 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 their mother to join me here when I went to back to the U.S. in in 2006, as it says there. We had Dan in the cupola in the jewelers building having this big uh, city model, and all the black ones are are their building. Is their building, and the building is the the jeweler's building. So in this cupola, according to rumors, there's a lot of dead bodies buried because this was the headquarters of uh, El Capone, and El Capone then used the building as to get in with the cars and then hide somewhere. And you can certainly see at the bottom right that Helmut might have been in the tradition of that building of that person because he looks like El Capone at the turn of the century. He poses there, however, where I go through, and I just came back to Munich Airport Center because he, as a German, wanted to also leave foot footprints back home. And so in the middle is the Lufthansa magazine from way back when he sort of rebranded his image. So he was quite the man and quite the gentleman. You see Dan and him up there, Helmut with a red scarf. And you also see something really green sticking out. And what is this about the soda? And what does it remind us of here? Who might have been the equivalent from our memory? And this gets us back full circle. One of our first shows was called Varsity Vanity. So what's that connection? Well, what, we're, what we were talking about is uh, the term that you like to use and others do too, which is a starchitect, meaning an architect who is a well-promoted star. And in this case, we've got a bright green, very, sh very sharp and very fast Porsche. And other architects have already made themselves known in the same way. I think once you get a lot of money and you get a lot of uh, name recognition, you want to show off. And so there are other architects who have done the same things. And remind me again, what was the car? It was a what was the brand of the car that we were talking about? That was what was no, so so that was the a Lotus. A that, that Pete Wimberly was was racing on racetracks with Steve McQueen, and so there's the same. But see, I mean, you know, Pete was the was the easy breezy, the shorts wearing guy. Which, by the way, and Dan also easy breezy in Nebraska. When we're into college, where the weather can sort of flip, you know, like you know, like uh, forty degrees Celsius over a day, he was always wearing shorts no matter what. So we went to school; it was sort of warmish. By the time we got out of the air-conditioned buildings, it had snowed a foot, and he was just like stubbornly you know, plowing through in his shorts. But again, climate, you know, that's Dan, the tough one, but otherwise, you know, that's not that easy. So, you know, mobility and uh, immobility and, 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 and mobiles is also another show that we have to discontinue unless we find a way to continue it. Next slide. What's absolutely critical, and this sort of we will dedicate an entire second to last show next week is the absolute importance of architectural criticism for a city that deserves, uh, you know, 
to call it being a city. This is a colleague of ours that now we're all self-critical and thinking, you know, how could we prevent this to be discontinued soon? This is a Stuart Hicks, who is from Chicago or in Chicago, teaches there, and also has a YouTube channel that many of us have watched. You have watched it and me separate from each other. He's doing a great job, way more professional than we, I have to say, and way more views and probably way more funding. So keep it running, Stuart. And he points out here in the show about his, uh, his town of Chicago that the skyline is carefully calibrated because it allows to break out of the stupid, as we call it, the 400 feet height limit. And so uh, next slide. And another thing is, and maybe to give us a little bit more sort of, um, you know, um, credibility and maybe what we are maybe doing a little bit better than 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 Stuart is that he's very much on culture. We're very much on climate, so we look at things from the scientific point of view, of course, in balance with poetry. But that kind of combination that only nature seems to do that well. So the difference between the two uh, water cities is that the skyline of Chicago, as you see it there, is being hit by the morning sun, which is not nearly as hot as the one that ours get hit by the setting sun. I'm holding up that hideous postcard that depicts downtown our field of operation for fryscaping, showing it glowing. And that glowing next slide, maybe ironically, tragically, might have been the inspiration for Howard Hughes, here depicted by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie, uh, as his reflecting, glaring sunglasses, as for the glaring you know, microwave towers that you see on the right. Go figure. And next slide, that's what we're wrapping up. You know, Kakaaka, we found out, is dominated by the Chicago firm of Solomon Portwell Buens. They have built most of the high rises. Now they also come out of the bushes to tell us which project architects were uh, behind it. And this building is the Victoria Place that uh, replaced our beloved Ward Warehouse, not in the same genetic code. Here you see kind of lame to begin with because you should have done Lanai's. They do these uh, uh, Ju Romeo and Juliet windows. And what's the point to go through the extra effort and money to make a sli sliding glass facade, you know, doors to then put the very criticized of us if there's anything that you learn from our 300 and a quarter a hundred, uh, you know, shows is don't do glass guardrails, and they did it. So what puzzles us, because where is this project architect from? Oh, you're asking Soto. me? Oh, you're yeah, asking yeah, yeah. me? I'm asking well, us. who is I'm this one? Us. This one, this is, well, the, this is the man from England. And we're going yeah, yeah. uh, to be talking about people coming from where they come from and what perhaps what influences those are. But what we're seeing in this Howard Hughes landscape that now exists is a bunch of different people, in some cases possibly just hired because they were well-known, who are coming here to Honolulu to try to build inhabited buildings. And how appropriate are they? And in many cases, unfortunately, yeah. they're not appropriate. Yeah, and next slide. The, the, the next project partner is happening to come from Italy. And we see what Jay and Scott Wilson have used as a backdrop for a show about seven years ago is the Bosco Verticale, the vertical forest building tower. That is temperate climate. So we found this hideous, well, it's not hideous, it is what it is, but given the circumstances, it got snowed in. We don't have that snow here, but, you know, so he doesn't take advantage of, you know, one of the most famous buildings that he hadn't designed, but that he should be aware of because it's where he comes from. So next slide. Instead, he designs things like that, which we talked about. Never mind. Next slide. And now Howard Hughes is rushing it. Somehow their window is closing, so they have to pop out the last four. This is one. They're not ashamed to kind of brand it. And this, this gets strange because they talk about what you talked about in the last two shows, which are archived in the Docomomo playlist, which is the capital. Somehow the columns at the bottle, but otherwise this has nothing to do with the capital. But what you see here is what's most in your face is next slide, which seems to be their underlying underlying theme, which goes back to the building by their by Ricardo Bofill when they had been doing the Crate and Barrel store on Michigan Avenue on the other side of the river. This building was going up and was kind of the downfall of a great architect who ended up tragic in neoclassicism. 
with that theme of so many floors making like a ribbon balustrade around it, bell, a rapid, which is pure decoration. And that seems to be the theme that goes through many, if not to say most of the buildings as we line them up there in a row. Next slide, talking neoclassicism, they go there too. This is going to replace the last sort of local piece, which is called Ward Center, which is where the last shops are, uh, you know, run by local people for little money, uh, you know, for little tourists, not the big high-end ones. That's going to go down and be replaced by this one here. And, you know, this gets memories like the Ali place is a postmodern piece of cake or these, you know, timeshare towers that Kurt ripped apart, rightly so. This has nothing to do with our mid-century modern masters, Ron Lindgren, show called Top Ride, cultivated classicism. And, you know, the, the other most important show that shame on us, we were, you know, shying away from comparing, you know, skins of the human skin and the one we wrap around clothing and the third skin facade or working title address code, addressing code. For that, it is like this uh, Tory Richard Huffy code with a tropical pattern on, which is rather silly as they both are, this kind of second and the third skin. Next slide, trying to, you know, still have maybe something we can draw from uh, Chicago, which is, uh, you know, leaving buildings naked, which they can't do, we can't do, or a pretty naked building is Marina Tower, or on the right, which is interesting, because next to Jeannie Gangs, who we gave the most credit and the most shows with her Kuula, that was, she, she tried the most, but she didn't try hard enough. Uh, and this one here, the St. Regions, which is the tall tower, that has no lanai's, although her aqua tower before that had, but that neighboring building to the right is together with this associated firm that they started the aqua tower, and that has lanai's wrapped around. It's very similar to my new place that I moved in yesterday, which has to do with the shore and the sea, and has lanai's wrapped around, and it's from 1967, these good days, these glorious days that we need to bring back. Next slide. An architect uh, that uh, Neil Abercrombie, our former governor, uh, was uh, calling out and saying, hey, he should have done a tower that was breaking the height limit. That's Renzo Piano. Renzo is known, talking star architect. He's probably maybe the most promising, if not the best, among the star architects because he's not a formalist, but a performatist and environmentally friendly. He has done the shard uh, high rise at the bottom left. But she can say is a reinterpretation of the uh, Trans Am building that is currently also a shame. I would have done, we would have done a show because we sent it back to Germany via San Francisco. So the Trans Am building in San Francisco, top left, is currently under revamping and reanimation uh, by Norman Foster, who we talked about a lot, who used to be his partner initially with the Centre Pompidou that we see at the top. He has also done the New York Times building at the turn of the uh, millennium and century in the center of the column at the bottom. And also he was on the Potsdamer Platz uh, as the horizontal image at the, at the right column in the middle. He, uh, Helmut did the very right one, the glass one. In the middle is Hans Kolov, and in the left is Renzo Piano. But more importantly, although near Honolulu, North Chicago has one by Renzo Piano, but they have a museum by him, which is the Art Institute, which you see down there, which we on uh, on uh, me on behalf of us was happened to be see it under construction uh, in 2009 at his test there. And doesn't it look like we could have that here? Because it's an umbrella, right? It's a big shading roof with shading louvers that blocks out the sun, but lets through the light. So we're jealous of Chicago because they already have a little Renzo. Going to tropical Renzo, next slide. Uh, De Soto is um, one in the fellow tropics that we call, because of uh, mainly political reasons, the trouble tropics, which is Miami. There is a recently uh, completed uh, Renzo Piana residential tower. And while it has one eyes all the way around, it's good. But also, it's a little deficient because we see this rendering with a with a sun going pretty deeply into it. And on the previous slide, um, if if you would go back and the show once it's sort of uploaded, um, you see. Oh, thank you. Yeah, at the bottom in the center in the middle, there's a there's a there's a there's a web quote to who uh, Kurt Sandburn, our last professional real architectural critic calls his friend, uh, who is Fred Bernstein. And Fred Bernstein 
uh, charges hit fellow architectural critics and saying, don't just look at how much energy a building consumes in operation, but also be honest about how much energy it consumed uh, through its uh, building process, which he called uh, the gray energy, right? That's what you call the embodied energy. And so we should look into that too. And, you know, he calls out some projects by Renzo Piano, one in Greece around the Acropolis, that doesn't look so good on that one. So everyone has to learn that, even the star architects and so much more, the emerging generation. Next slide. Of course, in terms of, you know, uh, the legacy of architectural, or oh, the next one after that one, Michael, please. This is, uh, yeah, this is the one that we could associate us the most with. This is in New Caledonia, uh, around the third turn of the century millennium. This is a cultural center. So this evokes memories of, Oh, this would be cool if Renzo would bless us with something like that. And next slide, this is what history has blessed us with multitude of buildings. There's the Reliance building that always mesmerized me ever since I saw it first in the early 90s when I was when I went to school with Dan and our first field trip to one my first city ever in America was Chicago. The Reliance building is a steel skeleton and opens up. You have more glass than than anything else, right? So then that was the precursor for the Bauhaus that we see below it, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the Neuschwanstein can, uh, castle that was built around the same time as your palace, uh, the photo that you reported on in the last two shows, was missing out on that. And probably the most is actually my castle back in Hanover, which is a neo-Gothic building at the bottom right. And again, your castle at the top right, because mine is doing thermal mass, which is appropriate and tempered. Yours is going night all the way around. So it always it's shading itself. So as one of the utmost challenges, which is climate change, it does a real good job. But what's the second most, if not more, I mean, equally uh, relevant next slide? What is that? What's oh, that? Oh, yeah, about? affordability. Well, this is, this is the problem that many people are facing. And of course, it's acute here in Honolulu. But Amazingly, in some other cities in the United States, this is also true. So the question is, how do we deal with, I mean, we talk about architecture as being livable and uh, suns and sh sun and shade and things like that. But most crucially is how can people afford it? And it isn't purely just looks. It isn't just performance. It's how do you make it so that people can afford to find places yeah. to live? And that Absolutely. is something that we're just addressing right here. Yeah, and while you know we can't remind you uh, of that on a weekly basis anymore, but what comes in around the same time that we used to be on the show is Stanley Chang with his newsletter. So he's going to continue. So listen to to Stanley because he's going to call this out. Okay, so how is Howard Hughes doing that? Next slide. We already know there was the Kilo Hana that didn't go so well. So now. Make sure there's a quota, not just of basically, you know, affordable housing, but also local architects. Here comes Architect Hawaii. So once again, a glass box, uh, same old warehousing the workforce, and the only kind of fancy stuff is what looks like teardrops. And it made us cry. Uh, next slide, because what's also important that you open your yourself to peer reviewers from somewhere else. So who do we had with us and who bought us? his opinion about that well this is your friend or my new friend uh also from germany who came to visit and uh we got to get we got together at bishop museum uh thomas and we got to uh i got to show him around and one of the things i got to show him was the traditional hawaiian holly which is the only surviving one in the world which is located in hawaiian hall and bishop museum and we got to talk about how livable it is how it's constructed what it is what what materials it's made of, things like that, which are traditional to Hawaiian culture. And again, that's a response on the behalf, on the part of the indigenous people on how to live using the, the material you have in your environment and also to survive, but be comfortable. So these are, again, the types of things that we always talk about in terms of where do our building materials come from? How affordable are they? All of these other things, which again, are not purely architecture, but are based on what humans need. Yeah, yeah. And so, as you can tell from the look of, of his face, he was not convinced that that affordable high-rise is in the tradition of the Holly that you show them from your ancestors. And this is one of the biggest conflicts of interest we have here, 
if we don't talk story and we don't do real talk, we are hiding things and we're kind of tiptoeing around. And we have that in the School of Architecture as well. There's our interim dean who has to give out award village foundation award to the students, which is great, but is then the donor of this award, which is Howard Hughes, willing to take back and to be given back as the emerging generation telling them how maybe to do it better. This is not happening. And this is actually what also was the nail in the coffin for Kurt Sandburn, because addressing that thing was the last article he ever wrote uh, for Civil Beat, because he, before he got pulled and someone must have gone to Omegar and said, this guy is you know too critical, so maybe shut him up. You know, this is this is tragic. And next slide, you know, Howard Hughes not being ashamed to kind of brand their uh, their microwaves with your culture's names and some weird stories here. It's about some weaving. And we think this building by Edwin Bauer, who was a Howley back in the 60s, has way more weaving going on. This is the Lagoon Tower uh, than, uh, than that Howard Hughes high rise there. So go back to real. So next slide, uh, uh, wrapping up is, um, you know, maybe we need to pull us out of our disciplines and do other ones. So do it in the world of movies. While Chicago is related to Batman, actually the Batman Begin movie was shot at the cupola of, you know, Al Capone's and Helmut Jahn's, um, you know, Wrigley building, uh, sorry, Jules building, of course. And then, you know, the Guardian here is peer reviewing him as the sign of hope, as the Flash Gordon of architecture. So what's the equivalent of, of darkness for us in, in Hawaii? Next slide. And we, uh, you know, many things we continue to have to do. We have to call up James Cameron and ask him if we're right that when he was sending his crew to Kauai to immerse themselves in the jungle for the Avatar world, if he went through Honolulu and drove through Kaka'ako and depicts it as the bridgehead city um, in his. So these are all thoughts from a year ago, uh, the spring semester last year. We kicked off in Germany and watched Avatar. Our team did it here. And then we consolidated the slide. Oh, yeah, your, your dog is cheerleading that. So the next one is like, okay, here in the... In the commercial and the mercantile realm, there is this thing you can buy, this silhouette on Etsy that in a very simplified, you know, purified way shows, well, we got that sort of, um, you know, um, artificial um, built environment in the center. But then when it sort of disintegrates to the side, it gets more gentle with your palace and your capital again. And then it shows hammocks between palm trees. It shows swaying palm trees and surf boards. So it implies, right, build the city as the beach. Next slide. And, you know, being critical about your culture is something that our Merch colleague, Martin Ancelini, that we did many shows about his brilliant proposal for rebuilding La Haina, he puts himself out there as being Oscar-nominated, rightly so. Here's The Guardian, again, peer reviewing that, because he was a consultant in the Encanto movie that he wanted his culture to be, to be depicted and not how people already know it through the media, through drugs and war and crime and all this misery, but for his twin daughters that are here with him, he wanted to give them hope and saying, no, our culture has more. And yeah, on the right, in the, uh, on the, in the middle, on the right, I found some criticism that is questioning that. It's being culturally appropriate. But again, if you make it into at the bottom right, your consultancy being sold like in Target, there's a dollhouse by Encanto. I think you kicked off the right discussion. Next slide. As uh, you know, Cameron was criticized uh, as having misappropriated Polynesian cultures. And he said, well, at least I started a discussion. So what can we pull from this architecturally? Maybe that tectonics and gravity are over as you know, Kaka'ako shows. And because it has to do with compression, so there's pressure. Uh, while how can you release that through uh, basically, you know, tensegrity, through tensile systems that you pull and it's way lighter and it goes to the degree that our, you know, emerging generation then, you know, makes Marti Martin and Avatar and Martin and Mar Martins and Martins are Avatars here. And we will do this actually now in the remaining weeks of ThinkTech and the remaining weeks of the school. We have the unique opportunity, thanks to John Grott, thanks, John to merge the travel industry students with the architectural students to fully go and parallel uh, our grad students. Next slide is Kendall Leonard, 
was here taking on the cake Hilohana that failed so tragically and basically revamp it with bringing back the Hawaiian culture of, uh, you know, fish ponds. And he wraps them around the building with ET of e foils. This is the stuff, you know, as from bottom up, basically grassroots, like just like Kelly Akina, you know, one of the, uh, you know, inaugural hosts of Think Tech Hawaii, his grassroots institutes. It needs to come from the bottom up, but it also needs to come from top down. And that's the last slide. And where are we going with that, Soto? We are going towards, uh, we're going towards a whole bunch of different things. And we're, we're paying homage to Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And he's one of our favorite guys because not only did he live here and he lived in a small, easy breezy apartment from which he and his parents had to be uh, evicted, unfortunately, but he's one of our he's one of our people that we like. One of the people also from here who's very famous, of course, is Barack Obama, and he has just recently completed his home uh, in uh, along the coast in Waimanalo which is unfortunately not of the type that we would like to see. And one of the ironic things, of course, is that along that coastline where his new expensive home is, there are a number of homeless people living in shelters and living in their own crude structures that they have built along with tents and things like that. So we've got those two types of, we've got those two personalities here that we look to as not only as for leadership, but also what their attitudes are and we have a fantasy that Dwayne Johnson must someday may be president, but that's not for us to say. Well, or at least he will be the patron for Friescaping here, as we call this sort of intervention. And he has, you know, additional qualification as top ride, the skyscraper movie. So he's not only familiar through, as he told us, I mean, as everyone on his YouTube that he did himself and posted where he is sitting in front of the Leona apartments by the Kashi Anbi. That again, because of the tragic, you know, happening of having been evicted, you know, he looks back in a in a in a sort of mixed feelings. But again, he he talks about the high rise he wanted to live in, which is across the door, which wasn't quite as which he couldn't see as a kid. So now we try to talk to him and saying, "Hey, high rises, yeah, and easy breezy high rises that you know." So hopefully, so we have to call him up. We have to call up James Cameron. Uh, everyone before we call Barrick, because again, as as you pointed out, so that's going to be the top down strategy in in addition to the bottom up. So that being said, thank you for having been with us today. For that again, next week we're going to dive deeply into uh, you know the remaining time we have over the weekend to prepare and, and make more the case why architectural criticism and an architectural critic who doesn't you know need to be uh, you know us because we've been there done it and Kurt has been done there so he's going to step up to the table and take over because every city that deserves to be a city needs an architectural critic okay see you for that next week and until then stay healthy and happy bye bye Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.